The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, teach thy people to love thy house best of all dwellings, thy scriptures best of all books, thy sacraments best of all gifts, the communion of saints best of all company, and that we may as one family and in one place give thanks and adore thy glory. Help us to keep always thy day, the first of days, holy unto thee, our maker, our resurrection, and our life. God blessed forever. Amen. Well, welcome. This is our last Rector's Forum uh, for the summer, and um, I'm glad to hear somebody be sad about that, um, as opposed to, ha ha! Um, but next Sunday, we will have a special presentation by Justin Hare, who's in the back of the room, and he's going to come up and talk to us about the GAFCON conference, which of course is this global Anglican conference that took place in Africa, and he was one of our delegates from the Diocese of South Carolina, and so he'll be telling us about that, a very exciting conference indeed. Um, but today, as is our custom at the end of a semester or at the end of a particular section, we finished John chapter 6 last week. We don't want to begin a new chapter before we start into the fall, so it has been my custom when we come to the end of a semester to do a Q&A with you. That just gives people an opportunity to ask any questions that may have arisen during the course of the teaching. Um, you may have noticed that I don't give many people an opportunity to get a word in edgewise, and that's simply because I have so much information that I want to cover. But I do want to give you an opportunity at the end of each semester to ask questions, and I'm glad to see uh, that Justin stuck around. Maybe when I said Q&A, Bill headed for the door. I'm not entirely sure. But I think between the three of us, if there's a question that arises that I cannot answer, perhaps they will be able to lend an assist. Uh, what's that show where you can call a lifeline or something like that? Well, they can be my lifeline in the event that we need to. Um, I see that Danny Gardner is not here this morning. It's interesting because he said, when are you going to do a QA? and a I've got a question for you, which always fills a man with dread um, because it means he's been gearing up for something, but he's not here today. I think it was a question about Christian nationalism. So uh, unless he shows up, we won't have to worry about that unless somebody else brings it up. But just an opportunity for us to have a conversation. You can ask me about anything that we have been uh, discussing in the course of the teaching here or anything else. Um, if it's something that I'm not prepared to answer, I'll tell you that, but I will do my best. So this only works, of course, if you um, prime the pump, so to speak. Somebody asks a question, and as I said when I've done this in the past, there's no stupid question. Um, you know, it may be something that you're, you're reluctant to ask, but the person next to you probably would like to know the answer to it as well. So please do not be shy. Questions only, though. Please, no comments or um, diatribes or anything like that so that we have an opportunity to get through as many uh, questions as we possibly can. Yes, Julian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to take that sort of comment anytime. Well, thank you. It is a blessing to be able to do it. I love to teach. I think that's one of my spiritual gifts, and so it is a blessing. It is not a burden to me, so I'm delighted to do it, so thank you. Well, I'm, my wife is still in awe of the fact that people show up to listen to me talk so much. So, <laughs> Anything else? Yes, Dr. Heikus. Okay, well... Um, the question is, you know, where would, where would, if you're designing a course for someone who is relatively new to the faith and you want to tell them uh, to begin to read the scriptures, where would John fit into all of this? Personally, I mean, telling them to start with the Psalms is perfectly fine, Dana. Um, although I normally tell people, start with the Gospels. I mean, don't start with the Old Testament. I mean, I, I know Julie Andrews said, you know, start at the very beginning, but in this particular instance, that's not helpful um, because you'll get to Leviticus and then you'll just be lost forever. Um, so, no, I suggest you start with the Gospels. I normally recommend that you start with Matthew or Mark. Um, Mark is the briefest of the Gospels. Um, it, it is a very quick, fast-paced sort of narrative. Um, or Matthew, simply because you have the account of Jesus' birth and so forth, and these are stories that at least somebody brought up in a nominally Christian environment would be somewhat familiar with them. I think John can come at any point. I think John can come um, at the beginning. It can come at the end. 
probably at the end is a good place, I would say. Read the Gospels um, pretty much as you see them in the New Testament is a good way to do it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. Um, because by the time you get to the end of the synoptics, those three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you get to John, then you're ready for that high-soaring Christology that you have there in the opening chapter in the prolegomena to the gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That, that is very heavy, deep theology. It's Greek philosophical language being employed in the service of the gospel. And if you're brand new to the Christian faith, that's, that's going to be a little bit daunting. What, what does all of that mean? What is this idea of the Word and all all of that mean. Um, but I think if you start with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I would say John at the end, but I would certainly read John before I dashed into the Pauline epistles. But I would certainly, if you've got somebody where to start, start with the New Testament, start with the Gospels, read all four Gospels, because ultimately that's what the Bible is all about. It's about the person and work of Jesus. You've got four biographies of Jesus right there. And then I would go through the Pauline epistles where Paul then begins to flesh out the practical application of the gospel for our lives. And then go back and begin to read the Old Testament. You will recall, and this is actually part of our first lesson in church today. The first lesson comes from Acts chapter 1. You do understand that it was only as Jesus opened their minds that they were able to understand the Old Testament, that is to say, the disciples, the apostles. They, they, they didn't understand a lot of these texts until they began to view them through the lens of Jesus' saving work, his death, his resurrection, and ultimately his ascension. And then, of course, it was the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, who Jesus said would open their minds and bring to their remembrance all that he had taught them. So... Um, that is the place to begin. You will never understand the Old Testament except through the lens of the new. So that's the place to begin. But a great question. Yes, Joanna. Right. So how is the order of the Old Testament set up? So the term that is commonly used for the Old and New Testament, the books that we have set, the official books, is, the word for that is canon the canon of the Old Testament, the canon of the New Testament. What does that word canon mean? Well, it's not a weapon. Um, it's not C-A-N-N-O-N. -N -N. It's C-A-N-O-N. And basically what the word means is measuring stick. That's what the word canon means. It means measuring stick. So the New Testament canon, those books that were officially accepted, were accepted by the church in its councils over the succeeding generations, Nicene Council and so forth. In the Old Testament, there were councils within Judaism as well. You know that there was a ruling body within Judaism, and it was those councils that set those books and the order of those books. The, the Old Testament canon was closed, and the New Testament canon is closed. In other words, even if we were to discover a, a, another gospel, it would not be added to the canon. The church has said that the canon is closed. The books that we have are sufficient for us to understand the gospel, and they are recognized as authoritative for our lives. The Old Testament canon was closed a couple hundred years before Jesus appeared on the scene. Um, but those canons, um, those councils really set the order of those books. Um, they are not in the order that they were written. That's what you need to understand. So don't assume that because Genesis comes first and deals with origins, which it does, it's appropriate that it should come first because it's talking about the beginnings of all things. That's what the word, of course, Genesis means. Um, but it was not the first book written. Um, the traditional view is that Moses is responsible for the first five books of the Bible. Well, Moses was pretty late on in the, in the story. Um, the oldest book, it is believed, that we have in the Bible is the book of Job. So, so that's sort of how they, they came into existence. But no books can be added to the Old or the New Testament from this point forward. Now, that's not to say that we're not going to find historical documents like the Dead Sea Scrolls that were discovered in the 1940s that shed light on our understanding of the text. But, you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, yes, I know, but the church, you know, the, the great conspiracy, the church suppressed certain books that were out there that they didn't like, you know, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, and all of this, you know, the Da Vinci Code stuff. 
And um, the reality is that the church had a very rigorous standard. It's not as though the church is unfamiliar with those books. Those books have been floating around for a long time. And there are solid good reasons as to why they were not included within the canonical scriptures. Not the least of which is that none of them dates to the apostolic era. In other words, while they are attributed to an apostle, they couldn't have been written by an apostle because they appeared on the scene hundred some cases 200 years after the apostle had died. So there was a standard, a canon or uh, measuring rod that was used by which books were included and excluded. Um, there were basically a series of criteria, historicity, apostolicity, um, the Catholicity, that is to say books that were accepted by Christians everywhere, not just enjoying local approval and so forth. So there were, all, there were a whole series of very rigorous standards, but but that's how it happened. Yes, counselor. Yes, sir. Uh, and a lawyer stood up to ask him a question. That's the way it is. <laughs> did you take a <laughs> So, um, did I take, um, am I taking anybody on a trip? Yes. Um, as a matter of fact, about 50 of us are departing um, in early June for the Holy Land. So, we will be going to the Holy Land and... Um, there were a number of people on the waiting list. If you didn't make it this time, I promise you we will be going again, God willing. If I'm healthy and the Lord doesn't return in the meantime, it's my intention to make that sort of a bread and butter trip. Um, so absolutely. Now, if you're asking about the battlefield trips that I have led in the past, we're not doing that this fall. Um, but yes, I'm going to be leading a trip to the Holy Land uh, in the spring. Um, probably, um, I think Brian McGreevy and I are thinking about doing an Anglican heritage tour, um, which would include um, a little bit, just a brief stop in Oxford to talk about C.S. Lewis. I'm going to have to, you know, rein Brian in. I'm just going to have to... Um, but um, we'll probably do something along those lines as well. Um, and, and it's a toss-up between it, whether it will be that or maybe a Celtic Christianity tour or something like that, which I have done in the past as well. So we'll probably do something. My hope is that we would be able to get into the rhythm of being able to do the Holy Land every other year. Um, because, I mean, I've done trips, of course, to Greece and to Turkey, which is my second favorite trip after the Holy Land because that's in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul and it's just extraordinary. Um, yes, a Reformation tour, those are always great, and, and um, an Anglican heritage tour, that's always great, but if you're going to have a trip on your bucket list, it ought to be the Holy Land. That, that's, that's the one that I think most people find to be the most transformative and the most impacting in terms of their life. As to the Somerton Diner, well, that was just a slice of Americana. Uh, that's all I can say, um, and it was absolutely wonderful. Um, we took the seniors um, up to Milford Plantation, had a great time doing that, um, but the Somerton Diner was where we ate and had lunch, and if you're ever up that way, you just ought to stop in. It was quite an experience, to say the least, but the food was delicious. Well, I am a movie buff, but you need to understand that I'm skeptical of anything that came after 1959, so you just you need to be aware of that. Um, okay, so... Um, so um, I have not seen Nefarious, and I, I, so I could not, um, although the name is intriguing, um, um, I have not seen it, so I could not comment, unfortunately. So, yes, sir. So the question is, the, the importance of St. Philip's, um, historically, um, south of Virginia, do we still have an impact and an influence uh, today, I think, is the, is the way you put the question, or is this just an historical thing? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as you know, at the time that the colonies were established here, um, certain colonies, not all of them, incidentally, but certain colonies were um, royal colonies. Um, so they were basically under the control of the crown. Now, that was not true every place. Um, Maryland, for example, was not a royal colony. Um, Pennsylvania, my home state, was not a... Um, royal colony. It was a proprietary colony. And that's one of the reasons why in those colonies you had freedom of religion in the sense that Catholics were welcome to, to Maryland, for example. And of course, Pennsylvania was owned by a Quaker. It was owned by William Penn. And so from a very early time, they opened it up to all uh, different religions, Christian and non-Christian. Um, in Virginia, South Carolina, those were royal colonies. And so when they were established, 
the state church was the state religion. And St. Philip's was established. It was the first Anglican church, basically, or the oldest and first Anglican church south of Virginia. And so, um, yes, we had a very um, prominent role in the, in the formation of this country and in the spread of the gospel. Uh, basically, all Anglican churches in this area came out of St. Philip's in one way or another. As you know, St. Michael's, that mission church up the street, that was also um, the result of St. Philip's. Um, are we continuing to have that impact in the world today? I would hope so. I, I would certainly hope so. Um, Bishop Lawrence said something to me that was very interesting. He said, I don't think that there is an Anglican church anywhere in the ACNA, the Anglican Church of North America, or he said maybe even in the United States, where they still do morning prayer as a principal service on Sunday. And what that means is that if you don't do morning prayer, you're probably not hearing those wonderful great colics and all of those wonderful prayers that we have in morning prayer. But my hope is that our influence is extending far beyond our city, far beyond our community, and we're seeing that. I mean, we have people that listen to the, our podcasts, to our Bible studies, classes, Sunday worship services from overseas. On every Thursday, you mentioned Thursday, every Thursday we have a couple that tunes in from England and, and listens to us. But we have people even in Asia and in South Africa, who have recently been listening to us, they find us on the World Wide Web. So as I've said before, I, I never thought when I was ordained that I would end up a televangelist. Um, <laughs> especially because, as I've said, Bill's the only one that's got the hair for it. So, um, but that's how it has turned out. So I think, yes, I think the reach of the gospel, that's one of the good things that has come out of COVID. Now, bear in mind that's a two-edged sword, because um, for people that are living in places where there is no gospel preaching church, this is a huge benefit to them. I mean, we get, we get requests on a regular basis, this is no exaggeration, for people who want to join St. Philip's and they live in another state. But they have been tuning in, they don't have a church that they have found in their community, particularly an Anglican church or an Episcopal church that is preaching the gospel, and so they're, they're, they feel tied to us. They've been listening to Bible studies, participating in classes, they want to be members. Now, of course, we have to explain to them, uh, membership is not something that you can do from afar, <laughs> because there's an aspect to the church that is not just the preaching and the teaching, it's the fellowship, it's the community that you have to be uh, participate in. But what it does tell us is that there's a great hunger out there, and um, we're able to reach that. But the other side of that, of course, is that people can get into a rut and say, well, it's raining outside today. Rather than going to church, I'm just going to tune in. I'll have my cup of coffee or, worse yet, my mimosa or Bloody Mary and, and watch Jeff. And... Um, which may be the reason they're drinking the Bloody Mary, quite frankly, I don't know. Um, but you understand that, you know, the New Testament warns us not to neglect meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. You do not grow except in community, and of course you cannot take Holy Communion, the sacraments, which are a blessing to us. They're God's means of nourishing our soul. You cannot get that from afar. So, yes, Todd Brown. Um, the question is, um, how do you pick the music on Sunday? And music can be a divisive issue in the life of the church, so where do you see it going? Well, as soon as we get that drum set in here, um, <laughs> fear not, fear not. I think most of you know um, who I am and what I'm about. Well, first of all, um, you know, St. Philip's is, by its nature, a traditional church. That's just the way it is. And you've got a traditional rector. But I think we have to be aware of the fact that, that music is not a static thing. It is just not. Um, and, and hymns that we consider to be, you know, tried and true, Watts and Wesley, you understand that when they were written in the 18th century were extremely controversial. I mean, Wesley's hymns, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, hark the herald angels sing. There were many in the Church of England who argued that those were little ditties. And the organ, 
You know what the organ was described as? The devil's box of whistles. The devil's box of whistles. So I just want you to understand that music is something that is very fluid. What we try to do here is what I would call a blended service. Um, It's not that I don't like praise music. I think some praise music is very good. And um, we have to realize, you know, we use the 1940 hymnal. but, But I just want you to just think about this for just a moment. You get a young couple that comes in here in their 20s or their 30s. And they look at the book that we used to sing out of, 1940. You do realize that in 20 years, that's going to be 100 years. And what we're basically saying is there's no good music. You can get the impression that came after, you know, after we closed the 1940 hymnal. So we try to supplement. What I try to do is to pick music that is singable. Part of the problem with some praise music, quite frankly, is that it's designed for an individual performer. You know, you can sing along on the radio as an individual, but trying to get 500 people to sing along with it, it just, it it doesn't work. So we're always striving to find new songs, contemporary songs, and of course many of that, the the Town and Getty stuff that we sing now, in Christ Alone and so forth, um, all of those are really good modern hymns. So I'm always looking for something that is singable. Now, it may be unfamiliar to you, and we have to learn it, but hopefully it's going to be something that's going to be singable, that we can understand, that we can relate to. And I always want depth of theology. I'm I'm not interested in 7-Eleven songs. You know what I mean by 7-Eleven songs? Songs that have seven words sung 11 times. Okay? So we're always looking for, yes, the great traditional hymns because they have a depth of theology, and many of them came out of times in which the church was really in a crucible, being shaped and formed persecution and so forth. But yes, I'm open to um, contemporary songs. Um, we have expanded the sort of instruments that we use on Sunday, so you'll hear flutes and you'll hear violins. What we're always striving for is the very best, whatever the genre. But conscious of the fact that we are, by nature, a somewhat traditional church. That's just the way it is. But not stodgy. I'm going to tell you right now, there is a difference between nostalgia and tradition. Some of you have heard me say this before. This is important. All right? This is important. Write this down if you have a pen. Nostalgia is the dead faith of the living. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. And there's a difference between the two. You get nostalgic about things. I don't want to change. Why? Because I just don't like change. You know the old, the old story, how many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? It takes three. It takes one to change the light bulb and two to talk about how nice the old light bulb was. We can never get into that place. So we're always striving for that. Now, the clergy are under strict orders from me that when they work on their sermons, and because we're on a rota here, you can work on your sermons ahead of time, and I ask them to work on them ahead of time, so that they can consult with the music department, so that whatever we're preaching on, the hymns match up, so that you've got a theme that is flowing through the entire service from the beginning to the end. Now, sometimes that works out well, sometimes it doesn't. Um, But that's what we're striving for instead of just coming in and what are we singing today? Well, you know, nothing that is even related to what the gospel is about. So that's how we do it. It takes effort. It takes effort. Georgia. Yes, I did watch the coronation. Um, My wife was invited to a coronation party, so she got up and uh, she went off to that. I did the civilized thing and um, watched it in my pajamas. Um, But yes, I did, and it was, um, I felt pleasantly surprised, a very, very religious service. It was um, not only a religious service, it was a genuinely Christian service. Um, And even the Archbishop of Canterbury didn't blow it, um, did a a fairly decent job on that particular day. Uh, The service was was an ancient service, um, and beautifully done. Somebody said, well, yes, but he had a Sikh read, you know, the first lesson 
I have no problem with that. Um, uh, if he's not a Christian, but he's reading the Christian scriptures and getting to the end and saying the word of the Lord, well, hallelujah. I mean, I wish more people that were non-Christians would read the scriptures, whether it's publicly or not. So the service I thought was beautiful. I thought it was ancient. I thought it was filled with a great deal of symbolism and import. What was interesting was listening to the British commentators afterward. And they said, this is a day that makes us proud to be British. And a number of them said that. But then I also heard, I don't know how many of them say, the service was rather anachronistic though, wasn't it? I mean, it was a very religious service. It was a very Christian service, and we are not a very religious people. So that was how many in Britain viewed this, that this was part of a long tradition and so forth, but it doesn't really reflect where Britain is today. To me, that's a sad commentary on British life. But at the very least... Millions upon millions of people all over the globe tuned in and heard the gospel on that day. And I'm a firm believer that the word of the Lord never comes back void or empty. So, God save the king. <laughs> all right, I got questions all over the place. All right, counselor, and then I'm going to try to field the questions. I'll come over here and then back over here. Well, the question is, between the Lord's resurrection and ascension, how often did the Lord appear to his disciples, and what did he do? And wait for today's sermon. Um, because if you, were you at the 815? Or not? Oh, well, then you heard Andrew sort of talk a little bit about that. Um, yes, I mean, we're told that between um, the resurrection and the ascension, the Lord, over the course of 40 days, basically met with his disciples. Now, we don't know how often he met. He didn't meet just with the disciples. He was seen by at least 500 at one time. Um, we don't know how often. Um, did he stay with them overnight, camp out with them? We don't have any of the details with that. There seemed to be times when Jesus was passing back and forth with a resurrected body between heaven and earth. We just know that over the course of those 40 days, Jesus appeared to them and taught them. And that's what we talked about earlier. They began to open their eyes to understand the scriptures. It's interesting to note that the first chapter of Acts begins with the disciples asking this question. The question is, Lord, are you now at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Now, here's a great example of them misunderstanding. They're asking the question, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Their assumption is that the Messiah had come to establish the old Davidic dynasty a political kingdom, drive out the Romans. And they've been very disenchanted and discouraged when Jesus didn't do that, when he died upon the cross. But now he'd been resurrected, can't keep a good man down. Their assumption is, well, now he's going to do it. And what Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the place that the Father is set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's the Acts version of the Great Commission. And the word that is translated power is an interesting word. It is a Greek word, dynamis, from which we get the term dynamite. So an explosive power would come upon them. But we just don't know how often I was with them, but apparently long enough for them to begin to understand that the kingdom was not what they anticipated and that they were going to have a crucial role in the expansion of that kingdom on earth in the hearts of men and women. So, okay, over here. Yes, Debbie, and then I'll come back here. So the question is, are we ever going to replace the current prayer book with the new ACNA prayer book? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, the new prayer books have already been purchased. They are boxed up in the office, and they will probably be in the pew, and we will introduce those in September. Now, of course, I know what that means. Everybody gets anxious when we talk about a new prayer book. Um, you will see very little change, quite frankly. Um, the new ACNA prayer book is actually based upon the 1662 prayer book. So the theology is really good. Um, the order's slightly different, so there may be a few little things that are different. For example, the prayer of humble access goes back to the prayer of humble access that was used in the 1928 prayer book. So um, we will introduce that. We will be using what is called the traditional language prayer book. That is, we will be using 
what I would call write one language, the these and the thous and that sort of thing. So I don't think it will be anything that is really different. But of course, the whole point of common prayer is common prayer. And you can't do that if we're singing out of a different book than the rest of the denomination. And so we will introduce them. Um, it will be green as opposed to red or black. Um, you know, we've got a, and, and, and we've got all different colors in the pew, quite frankly. Some have red, some have black. This is the black version right here. Um, but it is a very nice, very handsome thing, deep green, and it has a Jerusalem cross on the front. And um, it's, it's a lovely prayer book. But we will continue to print the entire service in the bulletin. But we understand that some people like to have the prayer book in the pew and want to get accustomed to it. So they'll be in the pew, but we'll print the entire liturgy. If you came for the Mere Anglicanism worship service. Anybody come for the Mere Anglicanism worship service? Well, if you were here for that, many people said, well, it was a beautiful liturgy. It was the ACNA liturgy, and many people didn't even notice it. So it won't be a profound change, but there will be a, a few little things that if you're not careful are just enough to throw you off a little bit. But that will be coming in September. We thought best not to introduce that probably in the summer. So, all right. Malcolm and Caroline. Just a quick question. Well, ladies first. <laughs> You're welcome. Are you, are, so the question is, given the fact that um, Britain has become a very secular country, and given the fact, and you're absolutely correct, that America is becoming more and more secular by the hour, um, and that is certainly true, um, the number of people who claim to be uh, confessing Christians has dropped significantly in recent years, um, particularly among young people. Um, what are the plans to plant churches and so forth? Um, um, we don't have any particular plans right now at St. Philip's to do that. Um, we've got a lot going on, but we're always open to that. Um, the diocese is certainly interested in planting churches, and we can support and help in that. And the Anglican Church of North America has made... Um, evangelism and church planting a priority for the denomination as a whole. So there is more and more of that. The reality, though, is that it's a challenge. And, um, you know, we've got to get past the idea that, you know, the old field of dreams mentality, if you build it, they will come, just put a church there. Uh, we've got lots of churches um, in America. I would like to see, rather than just planting another one here and there, I would love to see some life breathed into some of these old churches. Um, where the gospel is preached, where the, you can reach out to the community. And that is something that we're very interested in doing here at St. Philip. So right now, no current plans, although we're open to that, of course. So, all right. Laura? Yeah, great question. Um, the question is, you know, um, we're all grateful to be Americans. I mean, that is a que there's no doubt about that. We live in a free country. Um, we are concerned, of course, about the secularization of America and that some of those freedoms may be curtailed. And if you've grown up in America, um, you know, and you're over the age of 40, basically, you grew up in a very different America from what we have today. And we're seeing division, the likes of which we've probably not seen in this nation, the fault lines being as deep since the secession crisis of the 1860s. So what, how do we do, and how do we um, not lose heart? How do we not retreat into a siege mentality, um, but as Christians continue to bear uh, a winsome and attractive witness to the gospel in this day? Well, um, if you were here for the Q&A that I did for the grandparents' ministry, um, one of the things that I did was I started off by talking about um, 2 Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, just turn them for just a moment to 2 Timothy for just a minute, and um, let me say something about this, because, you know, Paul is dealing with this in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, he's writing to a young man. Paul is basically about to be executed. This was his last letter, most people believe. He's about to be executed, so um, he knows he's coming to an end. He's going to be passing the baton on to this young man, Timothy. And he doesn't want Timothy to be under any illusions as to what he's facing in the culture. 
I mean, Timothy was living at a time when basically the culture was on the verge of collapse. The Roman Empire was still there. It was still vast. It was still influential. Um, but it was a culture that was in danger of being invaded from the outside. And it was a culture that was morally and spiritually decaying from the inside like a giant oak. And, and, and in that time, when the foundations are being removed, what can the righteous do? That's, that's basically the question. And, and here's what Paul writes to Timothy. He says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Now, when he says last days, he means that whole period of time between the Lord's ascension and his return in glory. We're, so we're living in the last days. Now, whether it's the last of the last days, we don't know, but we're living in the last days. The final act is going to be the Lord's return in glory. And he said, and in those days there will come times of dis uh, difficulty, for people will be lovers of self. I've said before, this is the most prophetic word in the New Testament, I mean, this could have been written about 21st century Western culture and 21st century America. You think about this. For people will be lovers of self. My goodness, there's never been a more narcissistic time. <laughs> We're taking selfies of ourselves. That, that's what we do. Lovers of self. Lovers of money. Proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving the good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Now Paul wrote those words in the first century. Tell me those are not a description of where we are in the 21st century. So the question then becomes, what do we do? And I'm sure that Timothy was asking precisely the same question. What do we do? You're leaving. What am I going to do? Verse 10. You, however, have followed my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra with persecutions that I endured. Yet from, the Lord, the, from, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, and here it is, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. For all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the man or the woman of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Next verse. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. They will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. But as for you, always be sober-minded. Endure suffering. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Be salt. Be light in the world. None of us should be surprised by what's happening. It's understandable that we're dismayed. None of us should be surprised, and none of us should be disheartened. Paul said it would happen. He tells us what we are to do, and the promise is that in the end, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of all people. We should be hopeful and recognize that the only difference between a catastrophe and an opportunity is a matter of attitude. And that's a great question on which for us to end. Malcolm, okay. Go ahead, Malcolm, because I did say I'd come back to you. So, the, yeah, the apocryphal books, the deuterocanonical books, understand 
that um, they have nothing to do with the New Testament. They're Old Testament period writings. They're Jewish writings that were accepted by the Jews at some points in history and rejected by the Jews at other points in history. Protestants reject them because they were never unanimously accepted. So at the time of the Reformation, Protestants rejected them as being profitable for proving doctrine. Catholics maintained them, and Anglicans took the middle road. Uh, we say that they are books from which we can learn a great deal about morals and about history, but we don't put them on the same level as the canonical scriptures. Incidentally, this is the only reference, and this is one of the reasons perhaps why Catholics are loath to get rid of them, um, they, that is the only reference that you'll find anywhere to purgatory, as in the deuterocanonical books, the apocryphal books. So we do sometimes read them on All Saints Day, for example. You know that famous passage, we shall now praise famous men. If you've seen Chariots of Fire, it's there at the beginning. Um, but when we get to the end, we do not say the word of the Lord. We say, here endeth the lesson. And here endeth the lesson. God bless you. We'll see you in church.